Hello, I'm Tony Banbury, the president and CEO of the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, or IFAS. And I'm proud to open the second day of IFAS's virtual US election program 2020. I would like to welcome all of you who are par participating today, and especially IFAS partners working in countries around the world. Today, we are discussing COVID-19 and the US election, and we will hear from an outstanding panel of experts moderated by IFAS's own senior global legal advisor, Catherine Elena. When I joined IFAS at the end of 2018, I wrote that there has never been a more critical and exciting period to be engaged in IFAS's mission. Little did I know that just over a year later, the world would be faced with a global health crisis that has challenged our fundamental systems of democracy. Independent institutions of democracy are at the front lines of preventing such a crisis, yet they themselves may be under threat because of it. But even in the midst of the pandemic and the political disruption it has caused, I find reasons to be optimistic about democracy in my country. First time poll workers have stepped up in record numbers. Over a half million people have signed up to be poll workers through organizations like Power the Polls, over half of them under the age of 40. Many others have volunteered directly with their local election bodies. Here in the state of Virginia, where IFAS is headquartered just next to Washington, DC, early voting in the US presidential election began about six weeks before the technical election day of November 3. This innovation in response to the pandemic will allow even more people to exercise their democratic rights. And the lines at polling stations in Virginia have been described as massive, showing the high demand of the voters for alternatives to in-person election day voting. And I'm also optimistic because of the people on this panel and others like them in government, civil society, and academia who are raising their voices to uphold democratic principles. I look forward to hearing our distinguished panel discuss the wide range of responses to the pandemic across the US and what it means not just for 2020, but for future elections as well. I am particularly grateful that Jocelyn Benson has taken a few minutes out of her extremely busy schedule as Secretary of State of Michigan to share her thoughts with us today. Katie, over to you. Thank you, Tony. I am incredibly fortunate to be moderating this discussion with a state secretary of state, an election commissioner, an election lawyer, and a professor this morning. While I have a number of questions to ask our panelists, I encourage all of you listening in the US and around the world to submit questions at any time via the chat function, and we will endeavor to answer some of those during this live panel. Also, feel free to post about this discussion using the hashtag USEP2020. For those who are out there who may be new to IFAS, we are a 501c3 organization. We have a bipartisan board of directors and a nonpartisan organizational identity. And we provide apolitical democracy and election support globally. <clears throat> Our work is made possible by the generous support of the American people through USAID, as well as other donor governments and supporters. Obviously, the opinions expressed during this panel do not necessarily reflect the views of IFAS, USAID, or other donors and sponsors. However, we are delighted to bring you these views and insights today. So I will turn directly to introducing our experts. Commissioner Thomas Hicks is chairperson of the US Election Assistance Commission. And just a note for our international audience watching, the US does not have a national centralized election management body. However, the EAC was established by the Help America Vote Act of 2002. And it's an independent, nonpartisan, uh, bipartisan commission, sorry, charged with various tasks, many tasks, including adopting voluntary voting system guidelines, certifying actual voting systems, 
and auditing the use of federal funds that are distributed um, under the Help America Vote Act. Commissioner Hicks has focused significant effort during his tenure on issues around voter access, something that has obviously become even more challenging under COVID-19. Thank you for being here, Commissioner. Dr. James Tucker is pro bono voting rights counsel to the Native American Rights Fund or NAF. And he has tried a number of cases under the Voting Rights Act in the US. For those um, who don't realize, NAF is an, a national nonprofit law firm that provides legal assistance to Indian tribes in the US and has been doing so since the 1970s. Another interesting fact, he's vice chair of the National Advisory Committee to the US Census Bureau, which like elections has been in the news very much recently. Dr. Tucker recently authored an article entitled Voting During a, During a Pandemic, Vote by Mail Challenges for Native Voters. Welcome, Dr. Tucker. Professor Raid Ghani is a distinguished career professor in the machine learning department of Carnegie Mellon University and works to increase the use of large scale artificial intelligence, machine learning and data science to solve large public policy challenges. Professor Ghani is no stranger to elections, having served as the chief scientist for the Obama 2012 re-election campaign, focusing on analytics, technology, and data. And recently, Professor Ghani led a collaboration with the Voter Protection Corps to examine electoral disruptions, poll closures, and voting behavior. Thank you for joining us, Professor Ghani. And I will introduce um, Secretary of State of Michigan, Secretary, Secretary Benson, um, when she joins us in a few minutes. So in the US, we are climbing to around 9 million cases of COVID-19, 225,000 deaths. We have 240 eligible voters in this country. And there are 470 national seats up in this election, and of course, one that everyone is watching, the presidential election. Commissioner Hicks, as I mentioned at the outset, the US has no centralized national election management body. Since the decentralization of the electoral process sets the US apart from most other countries, as you know, how do you think this impacts both the voter experience and the integrity of the actual election results, particularly during this pandemic environment. Thank you, Catherine. I thank you for having me here. Um, I think the the U.S. is very poised to handle handle this challenge. Uh, there is over eight thousand jurisdictions around the United States, and so that basically means if you uh, put those jurisdictions in states you're running 50 different elections. Each state runs their elections differently. So for instance, a state like Washington and Colorado have all vote by mail, and they've been doing that for a number of years, while a state like Alabama or Mississippi has it so that there's a lot less vote by mail and you have to show up in person. But no matter how a person or a state runs an election, we ask that it be done safely and we ask that it be done securely. Um, the Congress gave the U.S. Election Assistance Commission $400 million this year to pass out to the states to aid in their COVID relief uh, efforts. And that was done to purchase new voting equipment, new PPE, and to work with agencies like the Center for Disease Control to ensure that the machines used in elections are um, cleaned and ready for use. Over 71 million people have already cast their ballots, which is more than 50% of the total that was cast in 2016. So we're going to see massive turnout, and we want to ensure that people are safe and healthy doing so. Thank you, Commissioner. Dr. Tucker, <clears throat> you noticed in your recent article about voting in the pandemic that members of the 574 federally recognized tribes face many barriers to political participation and no other racial or ethnic group faces the combined weight of these barriers to the same degree. 
How has COVID-19 exacerbated the obstacles Indigenous communities are facing in casting their vote? What changes are needed to decrease these obstacles? And what do you think is impeding these changes? Well, I think that the biggest issues are that um, America's tribe and tribal nations are geographically uh, isolated. They're culturally isolated. Um, they face linguistic barriers. And a lot of those issues are, are just accentuated and exacerbated by the current pandemic. Uh, one in particular is, has been especially challenging. Vote by mail has always been challenging in Indian country because mo um, many uh, uh, of the tribal nations actually lack what we call traditional mailing addresses, like street addresses where you would get your mail. And because of that, it can be difficult even pre-pandemic for Native American voters to register to vote and to receive voting materials. Uh, what we've seen from that is that it's, it, it just highlights the need to also have some in-person voting opportunities. Um, that's especially important for areas that are very high in limited English proficiency, um, which would be places in a lot of the tribal nations and pueblos in the southwestern states. Um, and in the Alaska Native villages, what we need with that uh, again also is that when you're when you're filling out a vote by mail ballot, uh, a mail-in ballot, it's especially important that you make sure that you fill it out correctly and accurately. And when you have individuals who have uh, whether it's English literacy, uh, English language barriers or literacy barriers, you need to get assistance to be able to do that. And oftentimes it has to be in person. The, the challenge that's been especially true in Indian country is that we've seen some of the highest COVID infection rates. Um, the Navajo Nation has actually led the nation in terms of the number of infections per capita and the number of deaths. And again, that makes it especially difficult when you need in-person assistance, um, trying to take those steps to make sure that you're doing so safely. Um, the other final issue that I'll just mention is that because of the COVID issues, many of the tribal nations have been closed or they have um, restrictions in terms of uh, when people have to be back um, on the nation. And because of the distances to be able to get to county seats, where many of the early voting locations are, are um, present or where you would be able to get assistance, it can make it challenging to be able to get back on the reservation before, before curfew. Thank you. And you mentioned in your article, a number of um, American tribes may not trust um, postal voting. And I think trust is a big issue in American elections, certainly this year, but I think it's been declining over many years. Maybe Dr. Tucker, you first, and then Commissioner Hicks, could you talk a little bit about the challenges around building public trust with indigenous communities, but then obviously um, with the voting public as a whole? Dr. Tucker. Well, I think, I think part of it actually um, comes just from the general mistrust that tribal nations have had for, you know, for hundreds of years in terms of any kind of non-tribal government, uh, especially uh, federal, state, and local governments. And the issue, again, is overcoming that, trying to convince people, first of all, the need to participate in federal and, uh, um, and state elections. But in addition, there's also a cultural norm that um, Native Americans uh, like to participate in person. They like to vote in person. It becomes a very festive event. Uh, it's been very common in many parts of Indian country pre-pandemic that you would see barbecues uh, and just big celebrations and celebrating the community, which is, which is great. That's what we would like to see. The other issue that just faces voters generally with mail-in voting is um, one of the scholars at MIT, Charles Stewart, has done a study of what the impact is of voting and, and how many ballots are um, it may not be counted for whatever reason, either because they arrive late, they don't have a signature match, they don't include a, an internal secrecy sleeve, whatever it might be. But they, the estimate has been that in previous elections, as many as 12 to 20 percent of ballots that are mailed in may not be counted for whatever reason. Now, I will say that the one positive thing about this is having that study has allowed, uh, whether it's the EAC or whether it's organizations like NARF uh, or state or local governments, to highlight and emphasize the need to complete the ballots properly and accurately. And there's been a lot of press about that. So in that respect, it's actually been very positive. And what we expect to see is we actually expect to see ballots that may not be counted for those reasons uh, to actually be a very, very small percentage of all the ballots that are cast. 
Great. And Commissioner Hicks, public trust generally has been plummeting in the US. And obviously trust is critical for the acceptance of the actual election result. How do we regain that? I believe that trust equals confidence. And so having confidence in the process is where people would actually want to participate. So I believe that uh, when institutions like the Postal Service and um, election officials overall are being um, attacked as being partisan or the Postal Service is not being able to do their job uh, when they've had a high level of acceptance throughout the years for, um, for working for the American people. I think those things can be detrimental to the amount of confidence and trust that can be bestowed upon uh, voters to ensure that they have confidence that their vote will be counted and counted accurately. So I think that we need to uh, embrace the folks who are still doing their jobs because the pandemic is still going on and these folks are still um, at risk of catching it and, and becoming ill from it. Um, I saw a recent study about the, the uh, overall um, demographics for um, election workers, and it's usually the person, the 50-year-old white woman who lives down the street. So it's your, it's your neighbor who's running these elections. Um, and so with the Postal Service, they're doing all they can, and I know that they've gotten some bad press and, and rolled some things back, which is a good thing. Um, and ensuring that we will have issue, uh, people getting their ballots overall and having those ballots counted. As an African-American male um, who has worked in elections for over 30 years, I know that in my community, the trust of the uh, federal government has been re re relatively low. And so uh, when I've gone out to talk to people about voting in the past, they've said, why should I vote? My vote's not going to count. Well, I watched a documentary, part of a documentary last night um, from uh, a hero of mine who recently passed, John Lewis. And he fought very hard to ensure that the 1965 Voting Rights Act was passed and um, reauthorized over and over again up until the 2012-2013 Shelby decision which stripped some of the uh, things out of that, that uh, some of the protections out of that. Well, for people to have fought and died for that, um, the least I could do is fill out a ballot from home to send my ballot in. And so that's safe, that's secure, and it allows for me to also track my ballot to ensure that my ballot was received and counted. Uh, if there was a mistake, because I voted three weeks ago, that I would be able to cure that mistake if need be. So mm -hmm. confidence can be there if the right issues are put into place. Uh, we've emphasized that we need to actually follow all the steps, whether or not that's reading through the ballot, um, filling it out correctly, and then signing and putting it back in the mail um, mm -hmm. so that people can have their ballots counted. And if need be, um, have someone help you. Uh, there, you know, ask a, a friend, a trusted friend to help you with that ballot uh, if, if need be, if you're confused about it or call your local election official and they will be able to help you to fill it out and ensure that your ballot is, is counted. Great. Thank and you. Pro Professor Ghani, there's obviously been a lot of attention on postal voting in the U.S., um, but you recently collected data from, I think, 35,000 polling stations to support efforts to keep in-person polling open during COVID-19. What motivated to you to support in-person polling? And what were some of the most concerning findings from your data? Yeah, I mean, as, as, as my fellow panelists have already made the case for why in-person voting is, is so critical to have, because if you look at data for mail-in ballots, you know, um, there is a, a, a shockingly high any 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 vote that doesn't get counted is shockingly high, right? It, that that shouldn't happen. But historically, that number has been about one percent, um, and and primarily coming from you know places like Washington and Oregon. And um, but now that 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 other states are um, are also getting an increase, I think there are two issues, right? One is people who haven't passed 
postal and mail ballot before that they they might be making mistakes. Second is that authorities that are supposed to process them and deal with them are not used to dealing with them. And so there have been a lot of studies around, again, um, New York and Pennsylvania, the primary showing up to 20% of rejected ballots or even more ballots rejected in the primaries than in an entire 2016 election. Uh, the, the bigger issue, one is just the number. Second is, is what we just heard about. It disproportionately affects people who don't have stable mailing addresses people who uh, have, you know, English language issues or filling out. So we've found again, looking at, you know, studies that minorities and counties um, tend to have a higher rejection. Younger people tend to have a higher rejection rate. Um, and that leads to inequitable um, voting outcome. So so that was the reason to kind of make sure that, yes, mailing in your ballot the safest way of doing it. Um, but having options um, that allow people to do it in person to make sure that we get equitable outcomes um, was really critical. And so what we did was we looked at um, the counties across the U.S. and a lot of the data coming from the, the survey that that around voting that um, that EAC does, um, and trying to see what is likely to be the in-person voting demand in those places. Who's going to be voting? People might be inactive, so they have to go in person rather than mail in ballots. Then looking at high of those in person resources, such as voting locations, machines, poll workers, um, and then looking at the gap to highlight what are the priority counties in each state that need to be focused. There's going to be a high demand in person voting resources where there are a lot of people, a lot of people traditionally vote in person, um, and where going to be in their poll workers or, or, or uh, machines or locations um, and partner with organizations like Ann Harbor Polls and the Protection Corps to focus on recruiting poll workers um, in the, as much as we want to focus everywhere, um, we want to be able to say that, but in practice, you have to prioritize where you allocate resources. And, and that's, in my mind, sort of the, the, the best use of data analysis is to really help, in this case, figure out where do we prioritize those resources where they can have the most impact on making sure that everybody who wants to vote can, can vote. Later in this way, and yet when you're a busy election manager, it can be very difficult to pause and consider that. Uh, Commissioner Hicks, um, you mentioned turnout um, in your initial comments. Before the pandemic, forecasts suggested that turnout would exceed records from the last century in the US. However, then the pandemic obviously hit and we had some states who still held primaries uh, in March and April and they very much saw a drop in turnout. Um, just thinking internationally, we've seen similar trends. In Mali, they went ahead with parliamentary elections in April. Voter turnout in the capital city was only 7.5% and nationwide around 36%. So I'd like to ask two questions about this. First, do you think it raises questions about the legitimacy of elected leaders when so few citizens might turn out to vote? And particularly perhaps when there's a rural and urban discrepancy because of the pandemic. And then second, obviously since those primary elections, a lot of changes have been made, including to facilitate voter access. Um, and I myself voted here early in Virginia on Monday. And the waiting time was close to an hour and a half, which to me suggested that many people are coming out to vote. How do you think that COVID-19 is going to affect voter turnout overall? Well, let me start with the second question first. And I think both of those are excellent questions. I think COVID-19 um, is affecting the way that people vote in two ways. One, I think it's energized, and it's, I'm looking more so towards the general election, because we know a lot more now in terms of the virus than we did during the primaries, which were in high gear in February, in March, in April, in May. A number of primaries had to be postponed um, and moved uh, during that time as we learned more about the as states learn more about the pandemic and how to keep people safe. So now we have uh, situations and we have solutions for people to be able to cast their ballot 
safely and securely. And therefore, a lot more folks are actually participating. I think another added aspect of that is a number of people are working from home and getting inundated with information and figuring out that uh, it will take them a um, very sh- a short amount of time to, to exercise their right to vote. 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of women getting their right to vote. Um, it's 55 years since the Voting Rights Act was passed and 30 years since the, with, since the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, allowing for all these groups to exercise their right to vote and expand the, the franchise. I believe that as we move forward with the um, with the six days being left until the uh, final data for people to cast their ballot, that we will see record turnout. Every presidential year, we see an increase in the number of people who are participating. One, that's due to the fact that our population is growing. But one, I think that it's becoming easier in some aspects to cast your ballot. Um, there are five states that allow for vote by mail. Um, Colorado, um, um, Washington, Oregon, Utah, and Hawaii. Um, And then there's other states that are, uh, most states have early voting. Um, And then all states have some form of vote by mail, whether or not you need an excuse to cast that ballot or it's it's no excuse to absentee voting. So I think that those um, will add to uh, increased turnout. Um, and now we're forgetting the original part of the question in terms of, uh, I believe it revolved around safety. Yeah, the connection between turnout and legitimacy of the, of the result. So I think that um, it's, it's, it can be viewed in both ways in terms of the number of people who actually participate in the process. But if you only have five people voting and three people vote for one candidate, that candidate is still going to be the winner. Um, if people are worried about the uh, legitimacy of um, the number of people participating, then we need to do a better job of getting out the vote. Um, right. The the I, but but I think that you know there the question of legitimacy revolves more about um, um, whether or not there's voter suppression um, mm-hmm. and preventing people from casting their votes. So, mm-hmm. so I think that that would go more towards the illegitimacy piece of it. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. And it is my pleasure now to be able to introduce Ms. Michigan uh, Secretary of State, um, Secretary Benson. We are absolutely delighted to have you with us. Um, I know you're coming from one interview going to another. Um, Secretary Benson is um, obviously the Secretary of State of the U.S. State of Michigan, a graduate of Harvard Law School, and one of the youngest women to be inducted into the Michigan Hall of Fame. So just for an international audience to understand, the Secretary of State in Michigan is an elected position and head of Michigan's Department of State, which is responsible for many different services in the state, but it includes overseeing the statewide elections process. And in Michigan, that involves over seven and a half million registered voters. Um, Secretary Benson has also authored a book, State Secretaries of State, Guardians of the Democratic Process, which is the first major book to be written about the role of state secretaries of state in enforcing both election laws, but also campaign finance laws. So special thanks to you, Secretary. We know you are currently in the eye of the storm in terms of election management. So we're so grateful for you taking some time to be with us. Well, thanks. So I might turn right here. Great. I might turn to you straight away with a question. Obviously, around 3.5 million citizens have already requested absentee ballots in your state, and I believe over 2 million have already returned them. Um, but you recently, I think yesterday, issued a public statement that it was now too late for voters in Michigan to purely rely on the postal service to have their ballots returned in time for counting. So they should instead hand deliver them if possible. For those citizens in your state who are still to vote, what challenges are you facing in supporting in-person polling? And in particular, what advice would you give to international election managers who are listening in this morning, who have to manage their own pandemic elections, potentially without any postal voting? 
Well, again, thanks for having me. And I think, you know, as an academic uh, coming to this role, it's been important to me to use data and best practices to guide our work and decisions. And that's why, among other things, when we saw what we were heading towards this fall, which was really a, a combination of three things. One, new rules in Michigan that any voter had the right to vote from home or absentee prior to election day. Uh, so the need to educate voters about those rules. Number two, extraordinarily high levels of engagement. We have had four elections this year and every single one has broken voter turnout records. And three, the pandemic. So with the combination of all these three things, voter education has been key to provide citizens with certainty and clarity that they have options to vote this year. And then also to make sure every one of those options, whether it's choosing to receive and return your ballot through the mail, choosing to receive your ballot from your local clerk and return it at a drop box or at your local clerk's office, or voting on election day, that each of those three were equally safe, secure, and accessible to all. Uh, and by doing that, we've been able to essentially spread out the voter participation so that no one um, avenue overwhelms the system. And as we get closer to election day, that first option, returning or receiving your ballot through the mail, has fallen off really and now as an option. But the two million citizens who've already voted have clearly heard the message, took advantage of it. And if we anticipate about five to five and a half million citizens will vote, our goal was to have basically a third take advantage of each of the three options. And we've done that now with that first option. We see more people now voting at their clerk's office leading up to election day. And then we anticipate the final third of voters will come in on election day itself, at which point they'll be met with PPE, poll workers with masks, gloves, hand sanitizer, all of that, uh, as well as other health and safety guidelines in place. And then importantly, we've worked meticulously to ensure every location will be open. We've recruited over 30,000 new election workers to staff those locations if people are unable to do so due to COVID-19 or other reasons. Uh, and so we've done a, an actual assessment of polling locations and ensuring they're gonna be fully staffed so that once that 7 a.m. on election day hits, we're ready to go. Thank you. And I know for those election managers around the world listening, it sounds very straightforward, but they know, of course, that it is absolutely not. Um, Commissioner Hicks had mentioned to me that he was um, last in Michigan right before the um, pandemic hit, and that was his last visit. <laughs> I'm interested to know that was almost pre-pandemic, and now you're kind of in the post-pandemic phase. In terms of your preparations for elections, what changed the most, both pre and post? Um, in particular, what change do you think you might have made as a result of COVID-19 that you think should be preserved for future elections? Well, uh, frankly, voter education was the biggest change because there have been so many things changing with this pandemic, so many norms that have been removed from society that we need to give citizens in this moment of certainty, uh, an element of certainty and clarity as to how to vote this year and give them that confidence that they'll have options. They can rely on those options. They can ensure their votes will be heard, or their votes will be counted and their voices will be heard. And so we already had a plan in place to ensure the administration of our elections would go smoothly, uh, even in the midst of high turnout. Uh, but the need to assure voters, to educate voters, to proactively meet people where they were and give them the information and tools they needed to participate and have confidence in the security of the system really increased uh, with uh, the pandemic and all of the anxiety and uncertainty that it instilled uh, into our marketplace of eco or ecosystem of, of um, you know, um, movement in our state. Uh, and uh, so we've done that quite successfully, again, looking at the data and saying, how do you best communicate to voters that they can vote by mail? You mail them an application. And we, along with many of my colleagues in other states, did just that so that they knew and had in hand the information they would need if they wanted to vote from home, to give voters that assurance that they could vote from home, that no matter how many other things change this year, that would not change. Uh, was really important to consistently deliver throughout these past several months. Great. And I'd like to direct one more question to you before turning to others, just to maximize the time we have with you. Um, in 2016, as you obviously know, the winner um, in the swing states of Pennsylvania and Michigan 
had around a 68,000 vote and 11,000 vote margin of victory, victory, sorry, respectively, which represented just 0.06% of the total vote in those states. Needless to say, many people in the US and internationally are watching turnout in Michigan very closely. And just to give viewers um, internationally a sense of the challenges that you're facing, as of Monday, the state had recorded just over 160,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases. There have been kidnapping threats in the news against the governor and law enforcement officials. You're in the midst of ongoing election litigation, and there have been false reports emanating from Russia um, that your voter system has been hacked. And Iran has, of course, been in the news, accused of sending threatening emails to voters in swing states. What do you think, and you've answered this in some way, is the most important thing you've done to encourage turnout despite these challenges? And, and in particular, what have you done to ensure that people can trust the result, even if it is incredibly close in Michigan as it was in 2016? I think through transparency and constant communication directly to our voters about the system, and that, again, that proactive voter education that we began in earnest uh, really early this year and, and, and have consistently stayed with has been key for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, we knew that really this year preparing for the elections was really about three things. One, building the infrastructure, making sure that you know, every avenue towards receiving and casting a ballot was clear, secure, installing drop boxes all around the state if the Postal Service were proved unreliable, which it ultimately in some ways has, uh, at least close to the election. Um, building out uh, security protocols so that we can confirm the you know, security of ballots and all the rest. We, number one, we built the infrastructure for our election system with all of these changes in, in COVID-19 in mind. Secondly, we educated voters about it because if you build it, it doesn't matter if people, if people don't know about it and don't know about their choices. So um, we put as much effort into voter education as we did into actually building the system. Uh, and then the third, the third path is the misinformation and the, the threats to election security, the threats to undermine citizens' faith in our process. We saw that as a third uh, uh, pillar that was, again, just as much important to focus on invest in as the other two, but which had many more uncertainties. And what we've now seen, you know, just a few days before the polls close is that we built the system, we've educated voters about it, they're participating, and, um, and they have confidence uh, based on the proactive messaging and education, data-driven and, and factual, that we've delivered consistently for months, so that now that that misinformation is hitting, it's actually not having the impact that bad actors would hope it would have. It's instead uh, affirming what we've told voters all along. Look, these are your rights. You're going to hear people tell you other things, but this is actually the truth. Go to michigan.gov slash election security to learn more. And, you know, we've, the, the proactive voter education that we've done has essentially build up a vigilance and strength among our electorate so that they know what to do when they see misinformation uh, or when the security of the elections um, are potentially threatened, which is one, not believe it, have faith in the system and report it to us so that we can investigate and hold those bad actors accountable. Mm -hmm. Great. I have a couple of live questions from our panelists, which I'm gonna to get to in just one second, but <clears throat> Dr. Tucker, one thing um, I just mentioned in relation to Michigan is that Secretary of State has already faced a wave of pre-election litigation, and of course, with a potentially close result, may face even more after election day. And this, of course, is not uncommon, and the amount of litigation in American elections, both pre- and post-election, seems to be steadily increasing. Um, much of the litigation is around modifications to the electoral process as a result of the pandemic. <clears throat> and a common theme in these cases, if I can summarize in a very basic manner, is preservation or expansion of voting rights versus stability, certainty of the law, the process, the result. And of course, the role of the state and federal courts in making these determinations is also questioned. So having tried a number of voting rights cases yourself, can you comment on the role of lawyers and courts in the electoral process in the United States? I, I mean, I think lawyers can and do have a very important role to play. I mean, I obviously say this is someone who does work with the Native American Rights Fund, which is trying to improve opportunities and access. 
Um, the unfortunate side effect of the 2000 presidential election in Bush versus Gore is that it's multiplied the number of cases that we're seeing both pre and post election. And that's been especially true this year. You really kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of the types of cases we're seeing. Um, some involve um, access issues where we've got we're, we're trying to improve opportunities to have in-person voting, um, to have ballot collection by individuals who may not have access to transportation. Um, Texas obviously has been at the forefront of a fight over drop off um, boxes for ballots. But in addition, as you also mentioned, there are there have been a lot of technical challenges that, um, you know, the, the argument, of course, is that you have to have these technical challenges and technical requirements met because they're, you know, allegedly because of the um, integrity of the election system. And those include things like signature matching, uh, whether or not you've had a witness match the signature, whether or not there's something as simple as having a secrecy sleeve uh, over the ballot inside of the other envelope that the ballot's mailed back to. And then the other big fight has been over extending the mail-in uh, voting uh, deadlines to receive the ballots. Um, and what we, I, again, I do think that lawyers can and do have a very important role to play. And I'll highlight again what we've seen um, just in the recent case that NARF brought up in Montana. There were state restrictions imposed in terms of allowing others to collect ballots, and they were very, very uh, restrictive. And the problem, again, is that what we found is that um, just because of the location of tribal lands around the country, the the county seats are uh, quite a distance away. You, you're talking about people who lack access to transportation. They may not be able to afford to pay for gas. They may not be able to take the four or five hours out of their day that it would take to drive to their county seat. And so it was especially important to make sure that in those instances that, you know, people were able to safely um, and uh, you collect ballots uh, for, for their friends and neighbors and family members and be able to drop them off. And again, that litigation was successful. Now, the competing principle that we're running into with all of this, and you're seeing this a lot with some of the recent U.S. Supreme Court decisions, is what they call the Purcell principle, which is where you end up, uh, basically, it's a U.S. Supreme Court decision that says that if you get too close to the election, the, the principle says that it would be too disruptive to try to change the rules um, and for that reason, uh, federal courts have used that as a basis to reject challenges. Um, I will say that notwithstanding all of that, uh, clearly we're going to still see, even on, even on the day of election, there are going to be last minute um, cases that are going to be filed to make sure that polling places that are being closed early or when voters are standing in line and they've gotten in line before the polls close, that they need to be allowed to cast their ballots. Um, in addition, as you also mentioned, the other thing that we're certainly going to see is litigation over efforts to ensure that voters are not subjected to intimidation efforts or efforts to suppress their votes, and that's very, very important. And again, it's it's great having Secretary Benson um, on as, as well with us because it's very uh, you know, the local election officials, state and local election officials, play a very, very critical role in working with the lawyers to make sure that every voter has an opportunity to um, safely and confidently cast their ballot. Because again, just going back to what I started with, with Bush versus Gore, literally every vote does count. And as you also noted that in just in the election four years ago, um, the number of votes that it takes to, to carry an election, it literally can come down to a single vote. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. And you mentioned <clears throat> the Purcell principle, which of course is a big one with litigation happening so close to an election. Um, Secretary Benson, the ongoing litigation that you face, does it disrupt election operations for you? Yes and no. I, Michigan has uh, not had as much, I mean, we've had a lot of litigation, but Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, certainly seen a lot more, uh, in part because um, we've, uh, Tried to sort out things ahead of time. I mean, there's there's lots of reasons why that may be the case, but but nevertheless, um, my focus, as, as said before, has been really you know giving voters certainty and clarity um, from mm -hmm. the moment that pandemic hit, and even earlier. And, and again, my background is an educator. I'm not. I don't come at this as a as a as a politician per se. I come at this as like the daughter of educators and educator myself. And so that's just been my focus, even with. And I'm a legal educator. I'm a I'm a Law, former law professor. So um, just giving voters the information they need about the system to try to say, um, well, I'll give you an example. We had litigation over 
what ballots that were sent prior to election day, but received after. Uh, and uh, we know that's been a topic in a number of states. If a ballot is postmarked prior to election day, but received in the days that follow, should it still count? Particularly in a pandemic, particularly when the US Postal Service has proven to have significant vulnerabilities or, or not be as reliable as we, we might want it to be right now. Uh, mm -hmm. So there was litigation in Michigan about that, but I did not change what I told voters, which was get your ballot in as soon as possible. Uh, and so because my messaging was consistent, even if the, the law went back and forth uh, to which we it was going to be accepted, then it wasn't, and then it was, and then it wasn't. Uh, I did not, in every single conversation I had with voters or in interviews, it's, I've been consistent and I've told everyone else as well to say, get your ballot in as soon as possible, because if it's in by election day, this legal dispute is irrelevant. Uh, and uh, and so by providing, again, that clarity and that direction, voters responded. I mean, two million people have already voted, and we've still got six days until the polls close. Uh, so um, really, our the story of our success thus far at least, has been that connection, that collaboration, that proactive education with our voters uh, to prepare them to be vigilant citizens this year amidst all of these other things, including the legal challenges. Great. And I'm conscious of your time and that you have to leave us in about a minute. So maybe I'll just um, pose a question from the audience to you. And then after you've had to leave to move to Commissioner Hicks. So um, a question is around a potential razor thin margin, obviously in Michigan and then perhaps nationally. Um, what role do election managers play to sort of defend, you know, the result, um, and then what role do other bodies potentially play? So perhaps if you could focus on um, the election managers, and I think we have commissioners we work with around the world who might be hesitant to be in the media talking about the result when a count is going on, when litigation might be going on. Um, what do you think your role is when you have that razor thin margin and there is uncertainty? And if you want to also leave us with any um, last word before you have to jump off, we would welcome it. Thank you. And my role is on behalf of the voters. I'm here to make sure every valid vote counts, period. No matter who it's for or how it was cast, that's my job. And, and so recognizing that I don't work on behalf of a candidate or a party or a political system, I work on behalf of the voters. And so whether a, an election has a large margin between the candidates or a small one, my job and the job of our local election administrators is to ensure every valid vote counts. And that's what I'll continue to fight for uh, with an eye towards what's best for our voters, what's best for our democracy, and, and in reverence to the power that they, our voters, have to determine our, who else has power from an elected official standpoint in our country. Uh, and that to me is really underscores the role of election administrators. You don't work on behalf of anyone other than the voters and your job and priority is to make sure their voices are heard, period. Uh, and, and to give them the tools they need to exercise their rights. Uh, and, and so in that regard, you know, I, I can confidently say that in Michigan, we have done absolutely everything up to this point to be prepared uh, on behalf of voters to provide a system that even in the midst of everything that's going on right now uh, to ensure their votes count and their voices are heard. And that's really what I'd want to leave you with, that you're going to hear a lot in the next two weeks about our system, our infrastructure uh, nationally and in Michigan, the security, the reliability, the dependability, uh, the legality. Uh, and um, behind all of that, behind all of that rhetoric, are hardworking election administrators, 1,600 in the state of Michigan alone, who will be counting ballots methodically and securely, who will be reporting out totals, ensuring that every, valid, every vote is validated, that every ballot doesn't get counted unless it has a signature on its envelope that matches the signature of the voter on file. Uh, so we've, we've, we're really diligent about protecting the security of the process on behalf of every voter and then also making sure every vote counts. Uh, and there are a lot of other folks at play in this, including judges and, and courts and politicians and candidates. But the bottom line is our system is secure and our votes will be counted and we will you know, fight every day um, until the official results are um, fully finalized and tabulated to ensure that that remains the case in our state. Well, thank you again, Secretary Benson. We wish you the absolute best of luck. You have hundreds of US and international election managers who will be watching and who fully support um, what you're doing and are so grateful for it. Well, so thank you again for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you all.
Hi, Commissioner Hicks, can I turn to you with um, the same question, this razor thin margin um, that everyone is potentially expecting. What are the role of other bodies, the EAC, perhaps international bodies such as IFAS, NDI, other IRI, civil society organizations? When we have that razor thin margin, it's common in the US, it's common in other countries for people to start questioning the result and causing turmoil. Turmoil, sorry. How do we protect it? Right. Um, I would say there's, there's two things. One, uh, the overall piece of it is to be patient. The results that we hear on election night are not the official results. As we learned in 2000 with the floor, with the Gore v. Bush uh, case, and, and when we learned in uh, Florida 13 and 2006 that all the ballots need to be counted. I looked towards New Mexico in 2000, which had an even closer race than Florida. It was maybe 633 votes or, or 399, something really small that determined the winner of the presidential race and, and New Mexico in 2000. So I would say be patient, let the election officials do their job. And in the future, if there's questions about the legitimacy or accuracy of the elections, be a part of this. And on September 1st, we launched a National Poll Worker Recruitment Day. Well, we got buy-in from a number of organizations around the, around the country, uh, sports leagues, uh, and, and so forth, and basically trying to get younger people to be involved in this. So if you're part of the system and seeing how it functions inside, you're less likely to feel that it's not legitimate and that the race is not, um, even though it may be thin, we have to make sure that all the ballots are counted. And therefore, if it's, you know, 2 million ballots, but the winner gets 2 million and one, that person is the winner and it's legitimate. Mm -hmm. Great. Dr. Ghani, uh, you heard Secretary Benson mention the importance of data. Uh, one of my distinct privileges in my job is to work with election managers around the world as they tackle some of the same challenges we've been discussing here. And in recent years, IFAS has been looking to data analytics to support election managers, but it is still more the domain of election campaigns, as you well know. So in your experience, what role can and should data analytics play in the administration of elections and specifically how can data help election managers in, ex in especially complex environments like a public health crisis? Yeah, I mean, it is it is unfortunate. It is sad that that campaigns use data more than election managers do. Uh, and partially it's because they have more resources. Uh, you know, both campaigns have billion plus dollars ish. Um, and, and that shouldn't be that way. Right. So. What a campaign does is uses data to figure out how do they prioritize their, their resources, who to contact for getting to vote, who to contact to register, who to contact to persuade, who to, um, and and I think that should be the 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 role of election managers. I mean, we we need uh, you know the resources to put into these organizations to help them figure out who is unlikely to vote given the current context. You know, we talk about every vote being counted. But what happens before that vote gets cast? You know, shouldn't every person cast a vote, and shouldn't every person's uh, choices be heard rather than relying on the ballot? Um, so I think I think we kind of need to figure out what is our overall societal goal in terms of voting. Who are the people, and and where data can really play a role is trying to understand who are the people who are not going to vote uh, or not going to cast a ballot. Which what problems will they have? How do they do outreach? Is it a language barrier? Is it is it a Access barrier is it a you know um, a participation barrier, um, and then try to figure out do outreach um, to to get them to to cast a ballot. The the challenge becomes that you know we've got so many different localized bodies, right? So that's good that that some of them can try new things um, and and figure out what works or what doesn't work. But then it becomes really hard to scale, um, and I think that becomes a, a huge issue. So for example, at the you know, if we're gonna get certain number of results, let's say you know every ballot got counted, um, except the ones that were not counted, that were rejected for different reasons. We don't even know the ones that were rejected. Um, 
did those people cast their ballot? You know, did they come in person? Were they duplicate ballots? Like different states have different rules around what they release. And, and so there's very little good data about what happened in the election. You know, we eventually get the numbers. We eventually get for each person um, in the country who was registered to vote, whether they voted, how they voted. Um, but what we don't figure out is all these little details because the top thing is what matters to campaigns, right? And so that's what becomes available so they can be used to do campaigning. All the stuff about, you know, what happened to this ballot? Why was it rejected? Was it an incremental ballot or was it a duplicate ballot? Was was this person also voting in, in person at an individual level for the entire country? That data doesn't become available. So I think what I would say is for election managers, you know, we need to kind of figure out a system where the type of data and the type of capacity and the type of resources that exist for campaigns, how do we replicate that um, in a bipartisan way um, to create a national or international infrastructure for increasing voter turnout, uh, for increasing civic participation? Um, and it could be a public-private partnership. It could be everybody needs to be involved. But I think we do need a, 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 an infrastructure for doing it, both on the data level, on the analytical level, and then on the people level to actually go and and act on that. And it's missing today. And I have one other question from um, the audience that I'd like to just fold into the closing remarks and my closing question to you. And the question is around the, the hyper focus during a pandemic on short term issues and responses. And does this mean that other vulnerabilities are getting pushed that might impact elections in the longer term. So considering that, and maybe asking my last question, um, which I think relates to that, looking ahead to the 2022 elections, which is hard to do when, when we're in the midst of the current one, but what might be the lasting impact of COVID-19 on our elections? In particular, what innovations or changes have you seen or would you like to see in response to the pandemic um, and what would you like to offer our viewers from around the world in, te in terms of strengthening democracy and elections in the longer term? Um, if you could each take maybe a minute to just respond to that before we finish, maybe starting with Dr. Tucker, then Commissioner Hicks and Professor Ghani. Dr. Tucker. Sure. So I, I guess um, I, I need to just use history for just a moment. The, the history of voting in the United States has always been one of growth and, and then retraction. And what I hope that we're going to see come out of this is that it's going to be a growth in terms of opportunities um, to cast a ballot. That, again, because we've had an unprecedented use of um, mail-in voting and early voting on a scale that we've just simply never seen before, my hope and aspiration is that not that those opportunities are going to replace the existing ones, but they're going to enhance the ones that we already had and that they're simply going to make it much easier to vote. And, and really, that at the end of the day is, is what we always want to see, is we want to see every, every um, eligible voter given an opportunity to cast a ballot, um, however that may be, and um, that hopefully will end up happening in 2022. Thank you. Commissioner Hicks. I think that um, some of the things, and I agree with Dr. Tucker on, on his um, assessment, I think one of two things that I would love to see uh, continue on, one, uh, additional resources, uh, that there's a dedicated funding stream so that we're not additionally running to the Congress to um, seek funds for issues that come up with elections, um, an increase in participation. It's amazing to me to see the number of organizations and young people and different ethnic groups that are more involved in the process now, more so than ever. But also what I would like to see happening um, is innovation, that we innovate to ensure that we are uh, changing the way that we vote. For the most part, we are still casting ballots the same way we did at the early part of the 20th century. And so I would like to see how we are going to move forward um, and do that safely and securely uh, and to also increase participation, whether or not that's vote centers or, or other aspects or um, changing the days that we vote on. Um, but we, we need to look towards innovation to get more people involved. Thank you, Commissioner. And Professor Ghani. Um, 
I think for me, the biggest piece is it, it, it's wonderful to say every ballot needs to be counted. But I think before we get there, we need to make sure that that, that voting is equitable, right? I'd rather 80% of the people vote, but in a way that represents the country rather than disproportionately today where where we don't get equal equal voting um, outcomes for, for everyone. So that's that's I think that for me a bigger priority um, than than just more voting. Um, the and again I can say that because I don't manage election commissions and 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 I, I think I care more about that. Um, second is that you know when we sort of hear all these things about I think making it easier to vote is of course good. Mail in ballots wonderful. Um, but even if you look at the numbers right now, everybody who's predicting you know the, the highest voting turnout ever, you know they're looking at maybe like sixty two percent or sixty five percent compared to 61% or 59%. Those are, you know, to, to people within the election world, they're big differences because it takes so much to get that, that delta. But for people outside, those are very small, small differences. If this is going to be the biggest ever and the difference is this much, we need to really change how, how we do this. Um, so so what I'm hoping is, again, to, to everybody else's point is, is we're going to figure out you know, not just how to make it easier, but make it in a way that that doesn't go down again, um, that it's not a one off thing, that it builds on top of that. Um, and then I think we have to, again, go back to, you know, um, how do we use uh, data and technology to really increase um, equity in, in, in voting? Thank you, Professor Ghani. Well, I'd like to thank all my panelists, um, Tony Banbury for our introductory remarks, Secretary Benson, Commissioner Hicks, Dr. Tucker, Professor, Professor Ghani. Thank you for sharing your insights and experiences with us. Um, it's discussions like these, which obviously enrich all of our own work um, and it's work like yours that gives us hope for democracy. So for those watching, this panel will be um, available on the virtual USCP 2020 website, Please, while you're there, you can also submit a question in advance for some of our forthcoming panels just by scrolling to Ask an Elections Expert. And we also invite you to participate in our video and photo uh, contest, showing us what does democracy look like to you. Thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to those people watching from around the world. And may democracy be the winner on November 3rd and beyond. Thank you very much.